This will be an event that is also asking for debate. And um, so you are also asked at some point if you have questions to participate in the discussion. There will be microphones for this. And I hope it will be lively. It's a bit a debate like the project itself. So what we are hearing today is the outcome of a project, I would say. Um, a project that was initiated and I, I think um, uh, conceived by Moritz and, and his, uh, his further colleagues. He may talk about this um, in, in a minute in more detail. A project to invite young researchers to talk about what they think are the important issues in discussing financial stability or financial instability that may have been overlooked by the earlier generation of researchers. Now, I'm part of that earlier generation, so I really look forward to, um, to what we have overlooked um, and what needs to be studied in more detail. And maybe uh, we have a, a chance to give some raise some questions also later on in this, in the, in this setting. So there evidently was a, a conference in New York several years ago in which young researchers were invited to do as I, as I just described. And the book that we are going to basically present today content-wise is the outcome, the outgrowth of this uh, uh, conference. I think this is a fantastic project, and the book will be visible later on uh, when we have our reception after this event. It's called Leveraged, and this gives, I think, uh, an indication where this next generation of researchers see a problem with our financial system. Maybe too much leverage. I, I don't want to um, uh, pre preempt, so to speak, the, what, what you have to say later, but leverage is obviously the key word that describes a financial architecture, a financial system that allows these type of things to build up at various places. Of course, our thinking about financial stability or financial instability was shaped by the 2008 financial crisis, and there has been a wave of responses to that, a build-up of regulation, and now the question is really, is that enough? Is that does this produce resilience? And um, of course, my, my, my own take uh, has been that until now, we seem to see a rather resilient financial system with, with outbreaks at particular places which are outside the typical regulatory radar, like crypto world, for instance, or what we have seen in the derivatives world uh, in the UK recently. So there are pockets of instability, but the financial, the banking system as such seem to be, in my, my perception, seem to be um, better prepared for turbulent times than it was 15 years ago. So th with this uh, much, uh, I, I don't want to say more about the content that will be done by, by Moritz. So let me say a few words about uh, uh, Moritz Schularik, who is basically the main host uh, in the discussion later of this, of this evening. Um, well-known, uh, also a young researcher, but already the generation that is, is in the headlines of, of our discipline, and in particular, Moritz is a very, I would say, a, a, global, uh, a global professor of finance, uh, perceived in many places. He has been uh, invited to important conferences also in, on, on, by central banks in, in, um, also in the U.S., Jackson Hole was one place where he presented his work, which is for all of us the place to be when you want to be influential. Uh, he has been uh, contributing in, in, in many um, places that all deal with macro finance, financial stability, and also monetary policy. Uh, he has been the recipient of the Leibniz Prize uh, uh, this year. In, um, which is basically the foremost prize for economic research in, in Germany. And he has many other uh, um, things I, I, could, I could say that uh, underline, that, that, that um, basically support the idea that he is one of the 
best known and most eminent researchers we have today, which is still active, pursuing a research agenda, and I look forward to further work of his and collaboration with him uh, as, as we move on. We have, Moritz will start to talk about the general idea of their project, and then two of the authors that are the, uh, basically representing the young researcher generation uh, will, be, will be speaking, Daniel Dickelmann from the ECB and Kaspar Zimmermann from SAFE here in, in our, our institution here in, in Frankfurt. And we will, in the second round after these presentations, we will have a discussion and we have three discussions, namely Loriana Pelizon, also from SAFE, sitting here in the first row, Isabel Wastinkiste from ECB, also sitting here, and Lena Tonse uh, from the Free University Amsterdam and uh, Institute for Wirtschaftsforschung in, in Halle. So uh, just, I mean, just observing it, we have a certain gender imbalance in both sides, <laughs> both on the speaker side and on the discussion side, but if we put it together, it's very balanced, right? So perfect. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for coming, and now I hand over to Moritz to uh, introduce us into this project. Thank you so much, Jan, um, not only for hosting us, um, but for these very kind words. I learned uh, early on in my, um, in my academic uh, entanglements that you're only as good as your last project, so judge us, judge me by what we're presenting now, not by the stuff that's far in the past. Um, I also want to say a very a big thank you to Frau Floto and to everyone else who's been uh, helping to organize this today, uh, which is, uh, we're very happy to present our ideas, obviously, to the contributors. We'll talk about them in a second. And to the panelists, I look forward very much to this event today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a short idea, overview about this project, the book, um, and the key themes, what we think is interesting, what we think is new, what we thought we'd do with this, and then, you know, um, Chicago University Press went with this and said, like, this is an interesting uh, book that we want to make with you. And then I'll hand it over to Kaspar and to Daniel, who will present on their uh, chapters. So Leverage, the New Economics of Debt and Financial Fragility, is a project, is a book that came out of a conference. And that conference was a conference that I predict will not be the last you go to. That was one that looked back at the lessons of the 2008-09 crisis, but through a particular lens. And you see this next gen uh, thing, that this, the next gen, the next generation. This is a group of scholars that we uh, brought together in New York in the Hudson Yards in the BCG headquarters. So shout out, thanks BCG again for doing this. Um, um, under the auspices of the Institute for New Economic Thinking to reflect on what we've learned uh, in new research in a decade after uh, the, financial, the, the, uh, the 2008 financial crisis. And uh, what has been important about this is that we sort of invited a generation of scholars that, whose academic career, whose research, whose thinking about the financial system, about economy was very much influenced by that um, watershed event of 2008-09. So that was the idea, bring together a new generation of researchers, and then to synthesize a decade of post-global financial crisis research on financial instability and debt accumulation. And there was something specific, and, and Daniel and Casper will remember this, this was a highly curated um, um, conference. It was not just you go and you present your latest paper, it was we, pick, we handpicked the authors and we sent them specific questions that they were supposed to address in an essay of about, I don't know, six, six, seven thousand words, present, take on the comments from the, con from the conference and the, and the critique from the discussants, obviously, and um, uh, come back to us with a, with, a, with a final version. And the mission was to go for the bigger picture. The mission was not to drill down into the nitty gritty of how do we calculate capital ratios. The mission was to think big about what we've learned. Um, and it was a mission to go against the grain if it's possible. So um, I think many authors just came back and said this was really enjoyable because you gave me sort of carte blanche, or you gave us carte blanche to think about things that we typically don't uh, have the time to think about building an academic career. 
What came out of this were 11 papers on what we thought at the time were the most salient questions, uh, followed by equally sharp discussions, and you find those in the books, uh, and after the chapters, um, uh, there is a discussion by typically very prominent young um, uh, academics as well. Uh, moreover, we wrote this, and that was part of the mission as well, to write for a broader audience. So you will see the book later. As Jan said, it will be available. You can look around and, and flip through it. Um, and there's obviously more information on these sheets on, 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 your, on your seats. Um, it, is, it is accessible. It is not uh, highly technical. There are um, you know, maybe a few regressions and a few charts, but overall speaking, this is a book that's supposed to be accessible for broader audience, and we ideally also would like to have this being used in teaching because it gives a good sort of topical insight into questions such as, you know, what, what's with the role of incentives for, for excessive risk-taking. Um, it brings me to the table of contents, which is this. Um, so we have a chapter on big chap, big thing chapter about if me, I'm from Princeton University, and how to think about finance. We have a chapter by Emil Werner on the, con the costs and benefits of debt booms. Uh, Emil Werner is at, at the uh, MIT now. We have a nice chapter by Rudiger Farnbra from Lausanne, if I'm not mistaken, um, about the role of um, you know, bank CEOs for what, what, what sort of what responsibility uh, do they play for, or did they play in the in the uh, in, for the outbreak of the 2008 crisis? Uh, there's work on bank capital. There is Casper uh, will present this nice chapter with Alessia De Stefani from the IMF on let's call it the behavioral financial side, the role of expectation and beliefs in generating um, instability and risk taking. Um, uh, um, Daniel will uh, talk about um, the uh, historical banking crisis and what we learned about studying history, uh, what we learned from studying history about the nature uh, of, these, of these events. And some of the key themes that come out of this is, are the following. So if you, if you zoom out, and as I said, this was part of the mission for people to zoom out, and you go back to the late 1970s, when economic historians typically date the beginning of the global financial liberalization wave, when the post-war depression era financial regulation system was dismantled, when capital accounts were liberalized, when banking markets were freed, when um, a lot of the regulatory barriers that came from the depression era were dismantled, one of the big promises that this you know, very um, important um, drive to liberalize financial markets brought with this was that deeper and more complete financial markets, in an arrow de bro sense almost, more complete, deeper markets would make the economy more stable. And I think a big theme of that book is that this promise that deeper, larger financial markets make for a more stable world has generally speaking, not been kept. We see today that large and deeper mar financial markets have not necessarily, and Jan mentioned, we have been quite resilient in, in COVID, but again, central banks have played a very large role in stabilizing these markets at the time. Um, so the question is, why has this promise of deeper market integration with more insurance options, with more instruments that can be traded, why has that promise of more stability not been kept and with what consequences? A second theme that runs through the book is, is, is one that couldn't be more topical today, namely the links between structural changes in the economy. Uh, think about growing inequality or think about uh, also automatization, if you will, and financial instability. So Artis Mian's chapter here is, is, is really path-breaking in the sense that he talks about the fact that rising income inequality means that a bigger share of the income pie is ending up in the hands of households at the top of the distribution with potentially higher savings rates. And that means there's more savings going into the economy, depressing interest rates that have to be absorbed somewhere. And where are they going to be absorbed? Well, in the rest of the distribution, because for every debtor, there's a creditor, and for every creditor, there's a debtor. So someone else needs to be on the other side of that savings glut coming from rich households. And uh, especially the idea that you can use credit or that indebted demand is a way to grow our economies has been uh, exposed in, in recent decades as a particularly fragile 
um, uh, structure and, and the, the aftermath of these uh, debt-driven credit booms and demand booms tend to be quite serious, as you will see in a second. The third theme running through the book, and so, it's, so I'm super happy that uh, Isabel is here, and with Daniel we have another um, central banker on the podium, is that there is a paradox of stabilization policies and central bank safety nets that this book um, talks about, and that in many chapters is, is implicit and in some very explicit, namely the fact that by taking an active stabilization role, by giving that, by ensuring aggregate risk in the economy, central, central banks have objectively made the economy safer. They have taken out some quite substantial tail risk. In, that's their mission, that's in our interest. But obviously an economy that's safer because tail risks are now insured by an institution with very deep pockets means that incentives to increase leverage, incentives to increase debt in the response to a safer economy rise as well. So that means that although central banks make the economy safer in the first step, the response of the financial system will be to increase risk, knowing that aggregate risks are now insured by, and thereby inducing higher risk in the long run through a highly, more highly levered economy. So is, are we, we live in a world where central banks then have to run faster just to stand still because we are insuring an ever riskier um, leveraged uh, economy. So this is one of the, the only chart I'm going to show you, and I'm going to hand over to Kasper in just one second, is a really big picture view of how to think about finance, where this book, and Jan mentioned it, maybe a new generation comes with different questions. So there was an older literature that many of you might know that talks about the benefits of financial deepening. Um, the same idea I mentioned earlier. Deeper financial markets allow for more risk sharing, allow for potentially more growth, for a more efficient allocation of capital in the economy. This new generation, especially the work that Atif and, and Emil and others have done, uh, and we show, see some very broad correlations here, points to the fact that credit expansions, you see here, this is an increase in household debt over GDP from in the past from T minus four to T minus one, so over the past uh, three, four years, is negatively correlated with growth going forward. And this um, negative relationship, so the idea that credit booms, the larger, uh, the more household debt to GDP rises over, um, over this period, the more negative the, growth, the coming growth outcomes are, is something that rings, rings very true for people who've lived through the last decade. We've generally seen that countries that have had the largest pre-2008 credit booms are the countries that have spent a lot of time deleveraging, where growth has been uh, depressed and, and low for quite a while. So um, I put this Mark Twain quote here because I think it summarizes very well what this book does and where um, maybe the, the novelty lies is that um, whereas we almost automatically assume that more finance is good, there is now uh, literature here arguing that maybe uh, it's uh, not what you don't know that gets you in trouble, but it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Because this evidence here, and this is coming from 17 advanced economies over 140 years that Atif and Emil and others put together, is um, quite the opposite. It, is, it seems to be that these, at least these episodes of fast credit growth, credit booms, tend to have negative consequences for the real economy, and especially on the household side. Um, and on the business side, these things look a little bit murkier. So a new way to think about finance that takes the old paradigm um, critically and uh, revisits some of what we thought was true that might be ain't so. So my last point is uh, what do we really learn new, what are the new points about, the new insights about the roots of instability? There's one important idea that Kasper will talk about, uh, which is that the old idea of self-stabilizing financial markets has given way to a lot of research over the past decade that looks at correlated risk-taking, that looks at biased expectations, that looks at behavioral factors in uh, driving uh, credit cycles and driving financial instability. So 
um, Kasper will talk about it, financial markets as sources of risk when expectations are biased, uh, or Rudiger's chapter on bank CEOs that are caught in the same bubble where there's a new research that looks less at incentives and skin in the game, but more at factors that have to do with, um, in a broader sense, um, um, expectations and behavioral economics. I think one very important insight, and then that, that one, the one that most people in, in, in finance struggle most strongly with when you confront them with, is, is a very simple empirical insight, again coming from long-run data, namely the fact that in credit booms, in financial booms, when objectively the risk to financial stability, the risk to the economy are rising, the price of risk in financial markets seems to be falling. That's, I have not seen this point made as clearly as in, in Tyler Muir's chapter in, in the book. And it's, so, it's, so, it's, 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 it's such an important insight because it's something that is very hard to rationalize with a central um, tenet of finance, namely a positive price of risk. So just to, just to get this idea across again, in, in situations where, finance, where credit is booming, where house prices are booming, we know that these are the seeds of potential trouble down the road. So objectively, in these boom phases, the risks to the economy are rising. But instead of pricing these risks through a higher price of risk in financial markets, the evidence is quite, I would say, quite um, uh, convincing, and, and Tyler talks about this in his chapter, that if anything, in these periods, the price of risk instead of rising is falling. So that is very hard to square with a positive price of risk, which goes against a lot of what we think how financial markets work. And then there's a last point, and, and maybe um, I hope Daniel's going to talk a little bit about this, and that squares very nicely with this year's Nobel prices. And, and Jan will forgive me, and Doug Diamond will forgive me for saying maybe that is also an older generation of very... Uh, uh, well-achieved uh, and incredibly important and, and smart uh, people. But it is a literature in which liquidity and liquidity transformation um, and uh, stands at the center of financial instability. Uh, and Daniel and Matt in, in their chapter and in, in, their, in their other academic work make the point that runs and panics, liquidity events are, are an amplification mechanism but they're not necessary for the severe economic consequences of financial crisis that we see. So their work, and I will say this is a new perspective, a new take on things, uh, is one where liquidity is, you know, even if it was this year's Nobel Prize, where liquidity is becoming more of a sideshow if we are to understand the deep drivers of financial instability. I leave it here. I'm very happy to... Uh, Welcome, uh, Kasper and Daniel, to give us the new economic thinking, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll learn what makes finance time and again so crisis-prone, and how big that sector should be, and how big the public safety network, because that's what we um, um, embarked on by uh, engaging in this uh, project, and um, these are obviously also the questions that we are going to discuss later. And now, uh, Kasper, the floor is yours. I look forward to your chapter. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Moritz, for letting me talk about this today again. Uh, this was very enjoyable. So I was, or I teamed up with Alessia De Stefani, who comes from a very different background. She, so she works in household finance, focusing on households. While I come from like a macro finance perspective, and we talk. But we both sides have very much contributed to like a new literature, a new understanding of credit cycles, and that's why it was like a natural combination. Alessia is at the IMF, so I have to say that this usual IMF disclaimer applies that she has, that I'm talking only about our personal views and not the IMF views. All right, um, so our chapter really started from this observation on this graph that Moritz has shown before, namely that these credit cycles have uh, crucial or huge macroeconomic implications. And this has been shown, uh, Moritz has worked on this a lot, showing that, like, uh, high credit growth increases the risk of financial turmoil, but also many of the other people who have contributed to this, uh, uh, to this book and uh, have worked on this showing that uh, credit cycles are followed by lower growth, by deeper recessions, they amplify financial shocks. Um, and so there's like this 
uh, idea emerging that high credit growth, at least accelerating credit growth, seems to be um, harmful for the economy uh, in the medium run. So, but one of the questions that very much remained open is how can we explain the emergence of these credit boom bust cycles in the first place? So why do we see these credit booms that then go bust in the first place? And uh, so the traditional explanations that think about excessive credit growth have very much focused on lenders or borrowers' excessive risk-taking incentives. Yeah? And I think to some extent what several chapters in this book show is that these excessive risk-taking incentives might not be enough to explain uh, these credit booms and busts. We do know that prof even professionals do not see that there's a crisis coming. They still have a lot of personal money on the line. Uh, we do, do see that it's not like the specifically risky borrowers that really engage in the housing market. So initially there was like this idea of the subprime borrower that was driving the credit cycle. And I think that has been very much replaced by the idea of the, the middle income class investing into real estate and hoping for these uh, additional profits that were driving these credit cycles. So one of the very natural questions that has come up in a very big and growing literature recently has, is if like sentiment or uh, base explanations uh, can explain uh, these findings uh, in the data. And these uh, sentiment driven credit cycles, I just want to give you a simple intuition how they look like. The idea is that you initially have favorable outcomes at some at one point, so that can be that prices are appreciating, you can see you have low defaults in the economy, GDP growth is booming, or your expectation of GDP is booming, and based on those things, you form positive expectations that might even be over-optimistic. Yeah? So you're extrapolating from these past experiences into the future. And on that, based on those expectations, you form your credit demand and supply decisions. Yeah? So, um, and then at some point, well, these expectations have become too optimistic, so you do see like a reversal, and that reversal can take the form of like a full-blown financial crisis, but it can also just be lower growth, lower returns, and um, the work by several of the authors like Matt Barron and Moritz, uh, Atif Mian, um, ha ha has shown that you have these reversals. And so what has been done is very much this uh, linking the credit expansion to the outcomes, and basically the idea is to fill in the other parts of, of, that, uh, of that mechanism. All right, uh, so what I'm going to uh, argue is that this recent empirical evidence that has come out and is growing and growing and growing and now also turning into theory uh, is really substantiating these early ideas by, uh, by Hyman Minsky and Charles Kindleberger, uh, where we do see that these expectations of uh, households or bankers are at times systemically biased, and these biases are linked to their past uh, uh, to past fundamentals, so the, to past price appreciations, to past profitability, etc. Uh, we also see that expectations uh, matter for, uh, for your credit demand and supply decisions, so both on the bank side and on the household side. And third, we do see these predictable reversals in asset prices and output. All right, let me start talking about the first part, which is really like how are past fundamentals linked to expectation formation? And this has been like really like the most explosive literature that I've seen recently. Uh, I think there's evidence from all kinds of areas in the economy that agents or people take their past experiences and extrapolate those into the future. So we do see that investors and professionals, so like the most sophisticated investors that we have in the economy uh, are extrapolating. We do see that firm CFOs uh, base their forecast about the future of the firm on the past of the firm, and excessively so. We do see that, uh, that lenders become more optimistic if their past profitability is high, so that's my own work, but also now uh, work by others that has confirmed this. And, uh, and obviously for households, you see that if you have high house, past pro uh, house prices, people expect house prices to grow in the future and are surprised because sometimes they don't. All right, so this is, for example, from the work of my co-author, uh, um, where she shows basically first that you have these very large forecast errors in house prices over time. So you do see, oh, sorry. Uh, so you do see these forecast errors that can be massive. This is for using US data from like the Michigan survey. And these forecast errors, so these mistakes that people make about the price of their home are very much linked to what they have observed in the recent past. Uh, yes, so that's the, the first part. I think then the second part is to ask if these expectations that people make are actually linked to these credit decisions. 
So if a household has optimistic opti uh, expectations and he goes to the bank, does that actually affect his, uh, the, the credit that he's getting? Uh, or, or on the other side, if a banker has optimistic expectations, does that affect the credit that he's supplying to the economy? All right, so just some descriptive evidence. If you look uh, in the data, so this is again from the US, you see a very, very close association between expectations of uh, like bankers on, this, uh, on the left-hand side and lending growth and also house prices and lending growth. But this is obviously just suggestive. This just shows that these things are in the economy co-moving a lot. Um, what uh, some people, like again, my co-author in her work has, has shown is that very much like if consumers are more optimistic about house prices, mortgage leverage increases. So they, they have basically higher share of credit um, uh, from which they finance their home. One important insight is, I think, that this is very much dependent on how investors perceive, what investors think about the asset that they're buying. Or is this like really something they want to invest in or is it something they want to live in? It's really like very much driven by these people that want to invest, yeah, that care about the return on these assets that drives these uh, effects. All right, what this implies, obviously, is that if you have a growing share of these investors in individual markets, you uh, have basically a higher incentives, uh, you have basically a bigger role for, for beliefs to drive up uh, leverage. All right, um, now let's think about the last steps that are missing. Um, and what I do in my own work is basically to think about not to think about this expectation formation because it's very hard to measure that in macroeconomic data, but rather link the original improvement in fundamentals directly to the credit cycle and then also to the, to the reversal afterwards. So basically go one step earlier than the work that Moritz has done in his earlier work. And what we do show in this paper is very much that if you look at the banking sector itself, if you have high banking sector profits today, that predicts a credit expansion, so the credit boom down the line. So the credit booms are usually preceded by high profitability in the banking sector. But then also these high profitability in the banking sector predicts crises down the road. So you know, even so like high profits, crisis follows. Yeah? You, you might think you know, like low profits, there is a crisis. So like, uh, I don't know, a bank makes a loss and then it goes bust. Uh, subsequently, but it's rather very much this high profitability that pre uh, precedes these systemic uh, crisis events. All right, so I think one question that I find very interesting and that is still out there for future research is like whose expectations are really the expectations that, that might matter. So on the one hand, you might have these over-optimistic borrowers in the economy and these rational lenders. And in this case, these borrowers might be constrained because if they go to a bank, the bank might just charge higher rates because the, bank, the lender, basically the bank, is aware that the borrower is over-optimistic and will charge higher rates as a consequence. Why, on the other hand, if you have like these rational borrowers and the over-optimistic lenders, the idea is that the lender will give you more money, but on the other hand, the lender is somehow constrained by his, his own funding that he's getting from savers in the first place. So I think one, uh, one very interesting question to explore is like, whose expectations really matter? Is it that everyone in the economy has to be optimistic? Is it only the banks? Some work has been done on this. So suggestive of that is really like the lender side that matters. And that's very much linked to this idea that these uh, credit cycles are supply side phenomena. So this is really coming from the banking system and not so much from the borrowers demanding uh, future credit. Um, yeah, so overall, I, what our chapter is trying to summarize and to say is that there's like this emerging narrative or idea that ties credit cycles and bias beliefs. Some other open questions and I think interesting things that people should explore further is like these beliefs about the tails. Yeah, so if you think about these credit cycles, these are really tail events. Um, um, and uh, so far, most of the work that studies expectations in more detail has very much focused on the average expectation in the economy, but that's, that's not really the thing that we might care about if we want to understand these big macroeconomic uh, events, but rather we want to instead, uh, uh, understand what happens and what people think about these very, very, very bad outcomes and how likely they are. Um, so I think um, a second thing that has been like, overlooked that I want to, want to maybe stress today is that so far we're very much talking about the boom and over-optimism during this boom, but there has not been that much work thinking about the bust and over-pessimism during the bust. So if you, have, if, I, if you remember the graph that I showed you on the house price expectations, they were very negative just after the financial crisis. No, people were thinking that house prices will fall even further than what they actually did, and that might actually make these 
uh, crisis longer and more severe. And um, I think that's an uh, interesting avenue for future research. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I guess then last but not least, um, I'm absolutely thrilled to present today. So thank you, Moritz. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me. And I, in this presentation, want to zoom out. I want to talk about banking crises, the history of banking crises, and actually how we identify these phenomena. There's an entire literature um, database out there that um, tries to find all these events. And as I will show in this paper, there is actually, um, although a lot of work has been done, there's quite uh, something left to be done. Uh, the chapter that I'm presenting is uh, co-authored with my um, colleague Matthew Barron and is titled Historical Banking Crisis, a New Database, and a Reassessment of the Incidents and Severity. And of course, everything I say today uh, is my and Matt's opinion alone and not that of my employer. Um, so, what do we don't know about banking crisis? You could think that after 2008 and Moritz's work, everything should be known. And indeed, a lot is known, but there is um, and a lot what we know about banking crises, when they occurred and what characteristics they have, we have from narrative um, banking crisis chronologies. That is basically literature that is very influential and important that looks into the recent history, but partly also 150 years ago, um, to understand how many of these events occur and what do they all have in common. And since major banking crises are so rare, that we have actually have no other choice as to go that far back. And what I'm showing here um, is a, a comparison of a very influential uh, databases. Oh, there's the, there's the laser pointer. Uh, also, earlier work of Moritz is, is here, which actually has been revised in the meantime. What I want to show is for the history of Germany, just as an example, it seems that these, all these um, uh, papers and databases seem to disagree on when crises occurred and which crises um, uh, or which event actually made a banking crisis. For example, there is uh, only one source here that says in 1880, there was a banking crisis in Germany and all the others don't say so. How can that be? Well, it seems we either do not know how to properly define a banking crisis or we just don't know what happened back then. And uh, as I will argue, uh, it's a little bit of both. So um, in this chapter, we looked a little bit at the existing chronology of banking crisis. And also with this on the literature that is written about historical banking crises particularly, and we identify four or five major problems. One is the so-called look-back bias. It seems, or we find, that apparently episodes in history, but also in recent history, that had major macroeconomic consequences, recessions, for example, they're the ones that are most focused on. However, as we will show, there are a lot of periods of banking distress that happen under the surface. They do not develop into a banking crisis, sometimes out of luck, sometimes out of good policy, or for other reasons. With this comes that they tend to overstate the average severity and to focus on the symptoms, and that is what Moritz alluded to before, of panics, of bank failures, basically everything that makes the news and affects us in our daily life. However, as Barron, Barron and co-authors argue, we may miss the so-called quiet crises, the ones that do not have these salient features. Third, there is uh, no precise de definition of what a banking crisis is. This has to do a little bit with the narrative reading of the literature. It's more a, an approach of you know it when you see it. Um, they tend to view them as well as binary events. There's either a crisis or not. And the reality is, of course, more complex. Maybe a continuous measure would actually help us to understand better which events develop into full-fledged macroeconomic catastrophes and which ones don't. And then, and this actually I found the most exciting about this work is what we call the hearsay bias. Is there are a lot of periods, not a lot, but there's a surprising large number of periods in the literature that are dubbed financial crises because someone else said so before, someone really pre prestigious before, and they did the same, and they did the same. And when we go back to the original source from 1913, we find sometimes that it's quoted wrong. So um, this, um, kind of motivates our work to look again at something that many, many very um, influential 
and successful people have done before, namely the history of banking crises. Um, now, what could be a remedy? We also propose in this chapter, let's use quantitative data. And that is very difficult, especially historically. What uh, Baron at Ultra did, they um, collected for, I believe, 150 years of history in 46 countries bank equity, so bank stock data, and tried to use that to identify which periods were banking uh, crisis and which ones weren't, and match that against the narrative evidence. They also say there's no single uh, correct definition. Instead, let's systematically assess the features. Let's use quantitative data too, and so if, enable researchers in the future to make up their own mind or to assess the situation as it serves the research. And um, also part of this presentation is to advertise, of course, our forthcoming work where we attempt to do exactly that. Um, now, uh, that is basically what I already said. Um, Baron, Werner, and Zhang um, collected these large declines in bank equity, and they show that large, uh, that uh, declines and especially severe declines in bank stocks predict large and persistent credit contractions and output gaps, recessions, for example. They can be used as a proxy for crisis severity, and also they often can be used ahead of time, meaning that, the, that stock markets are not so bad at predicting um, uh, distress in the future. Of course, having quantitative data for the, for the first time allows us to detect these quiet crises, these interesting periods that, do, that are bank distress, where banks are in jeopardy, but they do not end in catastrophe for the general economy. And to study these is especially interesting, of course, when we want to design financially stable systems. Um, I'll skip ahead here and come to what we propose in this chapter as a remedy, which is a project that is ongoing and if everything goes well, uh, should be made available uh, towards the end of next year. What we do is we review first the entire historiography and we really mean that. We try to get every book from the library on these 46 countries for the last 150 years, compare the databases and um, try to systematically document um, what has been said about these crises, write up summaries about bank distress events, and maybe look again whether there is not something that we find new, and this time not adopt an approach where we say this was a banking crisis or not, but rather give an overview of the macroeconomic backgrounds, what banks failed, what policy measures were taken, and so forth. Yeah, and uh, usually here someone shows you a, <laughs> a picture of their archival work. Instead, to convince you of the effort that we put into this, I just show you my desk in New York at the time when, Moritz, when the conference happened. This is but a fraction of the literature, these books here, that, uh, that we're looking at. Now, um, I want to share, share with you uh, some preliminary results. Of course, the work is not done yet. It is ongoing, and it's... I believe at this point we have uh, seven research assistants working on it, so I'm excited that hopefully next year it will, um, it will can, um, um, can become public. But one of the things that we find here are, for example, on financial causes. Um, a little bit in contradiction at first sight to a very influential paper that Moritz and a co-author wrote, is we find that only 35% of all banking crises or credit booms gone bust. These credit booms that Kasper just talked about are still incredibly important when we look at the periods with these drastic macroeconomic consequences, but when we define banking distress more broadly, we'll find lots of other causes too. And um, often these events also are, uh, are resolved success successfully. For example, a quarter, these are not mutually exclusive, a quarter of banking crises are due to financial interconnectedness. Germany in 2008 didn't have a credit boom, didn't have a house price bubble, but it did have a banking crisis. On severity, we find, and this is really preliminary evidence, early intervention, even historically, seems to make crises less costly. Forceful and early intervention by, can be the public sector, a central bank, but can also be historically other private banks. We find quiet crises are important, especially for a country like Canada. Canada has a reputation of being incredibly financially stable, whereas its neighbors, the United States, has a reputation of historically being very unstable. And we find, actually, that it's not because there were no shocks in Canada. Actually, these economies are so interlinked that the, the financial, the banking systems in both countries were hit by shocks, but Canada 
remain stable. And we can uncover with our new methodology these quiet periods of bank distress that do not develop into major contractions. On top, we also uncover a few forgotten crises that we like to say and also uh, correct a few of the wrong crises in the literature. Now, uh, in my last, second to last slide, um, I want to also share some preliminary results with, the, um, with relevance to financial stability and also maybe policy. Uh, as I already said, we find some countries are consistently more financially stable than others. Canada, Australia, New Zealand are great examples. And there are so not only today, but historically. So there is some kind of path dependency that it could be institutional factors, can be historical events that makes these countries more stable. And we believe with this database, we can enable researchers in the future to understand better what these designs of these banking systems are and maybe use them as, um, yeah, as, as blueprints. We found that banking systems have become more resilient to real shocks. With, with this, we mean natural disasters, um, earthquake and so forth, and COVID-19 and the Ukraine war are two very prominent examples. Especially COVID is an unprecedented um, macroeconomic shock, even by historical standards, if you will, but we didn't observe a banking crisis. And we believe um, this may have to do with the fact that policymakers today have better tools and learn from history. Last, banking crises tend to cluster. This is nothing new, but we find that they often originate um, when you read the economic literature closer from a financial center. So we would say for all policy institutions concerned with financial stability, it is very important to look what's happening abroad and especially in global and regional financial centers. Let me conclude um, with our main arguments in this chapter. There's no single definition of banking crises. Uh, narrative chronologies um, suffer from uh, various biases, and we believe that with quantitative data, with a continuous understanding of a crisis definition and systematic coding of information and our review, we can enhance actually um, our understanding of historical bank distress. Um, it occurs more frequently than chronology suggests, and um, many are met, as we find, with swift responses and do not develop into severe macroeconomic downturns. We, we would find it as maybe a next, next project incredibly interesting to investigate the crisis that actually did not happen. An example from the top of my head could, for example, be the Evergrande uh, in China. Um, it, it, I mean, for, 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 for some while there, there was real concern in the Chinese real estate sector and this massive corporation, but a banking crisis did not develop because in, in this instance, um, oversight authorities stepped in quickly and efficiently. Some countries, are consistently more financially stable than others, and banking systems have become more resilient to real shocks. But the flip side is, especially since 1970s, again, financial causes of bank uh, distress are on the rise again and have become much more prevalent. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Kasper. Um, short word on the choreography here. We're going to swap now. We're going to get the ladies on stage. Uh, we're going to have to put some cables on, but you stay close because we're going to um, do some uh, Q&A then jointly when we, when we move on to the panel. So uh, thanks um, again to all three of you for being here. It's a great, a great pleasure. Um, I will throw some questions at you, but we, I think we're all keen. We've heard from Asana about the book. We were keen to hear what you think. We'll throw some big qu picture question at you, and then we're very happy to have the discussion going among you, maybe, and we'll open it up, obviously, to questions for the audience um, um, in, in, in a while. Um, maybe let me start, uh, uh, Loriana, with you, because you, you sit right here. Um, we mentioned early in the book that um, there is a little bit of a red thread that this generation of scholars has identified that maybe the promises of financial liberalization, the promises of deeper, larger financial markets making for safer economies, better outcomes, hasn't been quite kept. Would you agree with that? Or what would be your perspective on, yes. on that big picture question? So I should say, Loriana is a professor here at, uh, <laughs> at Goethe University and a very senior member of the SAFE uh, professorial team. So. 
thanks for being here. So, Loriana, now I'll do that with each of you and then okay, we'll have a so little bit. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me and also, you know, for giving me the opportunity to start to read this paper. I just looked to, uh, let's say, the introduction. And, uh, yeah, I, so you start with, well, there are def several points that I want to stress regarding uh, you know, is it an issue to have this large role of financial markets, pretty much? This is your, your question. And uh, on the other side, my answer is that, well, if we have this uh, large size of the financial markets, is an endogenous result. So you can say it's due to liberalization, it can be due to, uh, you know, several other aspects. But uh, again, you know, it's not that the financial market is so large because they the financial market decided there is someone that decide and, and give the incentive or let's say the overreaction as uh, Kaspar over optimist uh, view regarding the role that the financial market can play. And actually we are all going uh, more and more in a framework where banks are playing a lower role and uh, let's say the financial markets are also playing more and more an important role. And, and clearly this is a decision that someone voluntarily or not has taken. And, uh, and the question then is, uh, uh, I think that we need to ask is, uh, why are we having this type of structure now? Uh, and uh, clearly, if we believe that uh, you know, it is too large, what are then the incentives that we need to provide to the system in order eventually to shrink it? a little bit, and then what will be the consequences? So I know that maybe I'm answering to your question with several other questions, but the key point that I want to make is that uh, you can blame the financial market as you can blame all the people working in the financial in the industry or whatever, but I want to stress that this is an endogenous uh, aspect because sometimes we, we are happy to blame, uh, let's say, a structure and we do not realize that maybe the responsibility is not on the structure, but in, on those that decide this type of structure. And the same applies, if you want, to the financial crisis. Since you start from the 2008 uh, financial crisis, you know, the way in which I'm usually teaching the financial crisis to the students, I start with a list that I call it the hell of shame. And I'm starting, you know, with all the actors of this uh, uh, crisis, and, uh, uh, that, and the key point is that in this case, all of them have an incentive to participate to the party. You know, householders that do not have a house and clearly they have a house for a cheap price, why you should not participate? It's perfectly rational or maybe over optimistic, but you participate, you know, uh, the financial institutions, they are making money, why they're not doing it? Regulators, they are looking to the banks, they were very profitable, all the risk is going out of the balance sheet, is very good. Politicians, they were very happy and actually they survived far better than all the other to this crisis. So I think that the key question we need to ask is, what are the incentives that produce this type of structure and how can we change these incentives? But anyway, I, I can continue, but I'm stopping here. Uh, let me pass that question straight on to Isabel. Isabel, you are um, at the European Central Bank, the international department, and you're heading it. Um, the, let me pass on Loriana's question. Do you think that growth of the financial sector is endogenous to the safety net that central banks are providing to it? Is that is the potentially excessive debt accumulation also partly driven by the implicit insurance that is out there when things go bad? Well, um, maybe I start by thanking you for inviting to the panel. That's the easy part, uh, uh, and uh, also to say because, of course, I work at the ECB, but the views Absolutely. are my own. I always have to give this disclaimer, and uh, it always takes two seconds, but I have to say that. So, I mean, on, on your question, to what extent um, the safety nets per se are driving the size in the financial sector? I mean, I would think that it's more the other way around that the causality goes, right? So you have a response to financial crisis, and the financial system is getting bigger and bigger. Of course you need to also have a proportionately bigger response. Another reason, of course, why the balance sheets of central banks have grown is just a low natural rate of interest, which brings you closer to the effective lower bound, so you're, you're expanding your balance sheet more easily. And the factors driving the low R star are not necessarily driven by the central bank, right? 
At the same time, of course, we have a lot of questions when you roll out these safety nets, there's always a discussion on moral hazard, right? I mean, the first thing is, of course, the moment that the crisis happens, it's not a time to then not say, let's at least respond to that, where right? you don't want to make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are things you can do um, looking forward to prevent. One is, of course, we always talk about the same as the regulation of the system. But there's also things you can do in the design of your safety net measures that at least you know, mitigate these effects. I don't think you can fully mitigate moral hazard, to be honest. Right? You can mitigate it to the max possible. But for instance, you know, you know, conditionality in the design or having some sort of private sector stake in the design at least can mitigate these kind of moral hazard concerns that you may have. And I think that is an important element where you know, I think more analysis and research needs to be done and at least finding the right balance, right? And I think, for instance, the pandemic was a, was a good example, right? I mean, there was you know, clear need for support in the system, but I think all the discussions in the policy front were already endogenizing this risk of moral hazard. If you roll out a support for too long, you, you kill competition in the economy potentially, you create zombie institutions, and that's, of course, not good for long-term growth. So when you design these measures, you constantly need to have that in mind. And I think that's an important consideration on the policy front. It's a very important point. And if you allow me, I'll, I'll follow up um, with one question. Because also Jan mentioned at the beginning, and it's something that I'll keep coming back. I was at the Fed in, in 2020 when the COVID crisis happened. And Jan said, yeah, that's, that was a success story. We've seen the systems more resilient. And you know, there's one way of reading it that way. The other way of reading it is it was stable because within, as Daniel told us, within uh, a week or so of the, of the size of that uh, shock becoming clear, uh, central banks have yet again done things that were unimaginable before, um, intervening in corporate bond markets, being sort of market maker of last resort. I know that's something that Lorena thinks about very hard. Um, um, you know, there's talk about bailing out sort of, you know, hedge funds that engage in, in the junk bond market. What is it that makes, I mean, what, what's your reading essentially of that? Is that a success story or is that something that speaks to, in a way, also the book and the leverage situation that we are in this, in a way, in this endemic financial instability where uh, we, we have this big debt edifice that whatever reason there's so much debt and not more equity in the system, happy to discuss that, that you know, we, we more than ever need this stabilizer when anything bad happens. Well, I mean, I think if, if you look at that, uh, the pandemic initially discussion that we had at the policy front, right, if you would have looked at any model that would have predicted corporate insolvencies in that kind of shock, they would have been much, much higher, right? And I think one of the reasons why they didn't go so high Actually, the main reason is the policy response, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the discussion focusing on what would have happened absent such policy response helped to bring this policy response on board. Now then the question is, is has it been designed adequately enough to avoid you know, the longer term risks that come with it? I would say it's maybe too early to say in some ways. And I think there were many measures rolled out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one needs to look at all these variety of measures and different types and learn from that, right? I mean, there was, you know, when you're in a crisis, you cannot spend, uh, you know, months analyzing, right? You need to have a rapid response. Um, and then you become more refined over time. And I think, you know, the good thing in the COVID crisis was that you had the global financial crisis, if I may say that. It's not good to have crisis, but you learn from them. And so many of the tools that were rolled out in the pandemic were already lying on the shelf in, in policy institutions to be rolled out, and we had already learned lessons from them. And I'm sure we, from the pandemic, we will learn lessons again, right? And we're already doing these comparisons across jurisdictions, right? You know, because different countries have different compositions and types of support, what they mean for the real economy, what they mean for the financial sector. But I would say, you know, it's something where we still need to learn. But m the first reaction, I think, was good and better than, you know, not having the policy response out there. I mean, that was very, very important to get over the pandemic. Anyway. Let me give the ball quickly back to Loriana, because I know you've, you've thought about this, you worked on this, but so it, it looks that the financial stability mandate of central banks has become almost systematic now. Whenever there is something, you know, we know the playbook, press the button, flood the market with liquidity, ma make markets if you need to. How do we prevent this systematic financial policy that we see now, more or less, from having the side effects that we yeah. mentioned? Yeah, so, you know, I 
Thank you very much, because I, I think that uh, uh, I don't want to criticize the central banks, because I understand that they were clearly operating in an emergency period and so on. But uh, what I think it will be important now is to uh, start to think seriously on the role that they are continuously playing in the market, not only as a lender of last resort, but also as a market maker of last resort. That is a word that uh, when I try to address this uh, discussion with other colleagues of you, they don't even want to talk about. That's the, the main problem, I think. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the reason why I, I think that it is important we start to talk about this is that uh, uh, I'm not saying that we should say, well, the central bank shouldn't intervene, because we know that there is, will be a completely inconsistency on taking this type of commitment, but we need to try to make it uh, enough painful, uh, ex ante, so it has to be clear ex ante, that it is very painful, this type of intervention, so that it is not becoming norma nor a normal thing that uh, you will trust on the central bank to intervene. Because as soon as you will start, the market will challenge the central bank all the time. They will continue to challenge, because clearly they know that uh, the tail risk will be covered for free by the central bank. And, uh, and we need to go out from this loop, because not only uh, you know, this is creating moral hazard. But on the other side, uh, if the financial sector is becoming larger, they, this, the, 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 the central banks are also destroying part of the market and they will become the largest player. You know, uh, we don't have any interbank market uh, because of the crisis of 2008. It has been substituted with the repo market, but if the central bank will start to intervene in the repo market in a massive way, well, we will have that then this repo market also, the, the, let's say, the one without the central bank will disappear, and you will have the one where just playing uh, by the central bank, because banks will start then just to go to the central bank to post collateral and get cash, and this prevent the role of the financial market. So I think that we need, of course, more research, but on the other side also an open discussion about... Uh, how really it is optimal to implement money market of last resort. This is my view. Um, let, me, let me introduce Lena Tonsa, professor at Amsterdam and also affiliated with the colleagues in Halle and uh, with a very steep uh, career, research career in recent years. Very happy to have you. Let me come back to like, ask this question slightly differently. I think it was Larry Summers who once said, if you've never missed an airplane, you've spent too much time at the airport. Is, is the optimal number of financial crises zero? If we have zero crises, have we been too careful? Can we, or is, should, let's rephrase it, should central banks sometimes maybe sit on their hands just to make sure that, you know, uh, we not be, don't too risk averse and invite everyone to be complacent. What do you think? Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation and congratulations on this really interesting book. So, uh, can we avoid crisis or should we avoid crisis? Um, I, I think are two very different questions and probably from some aspects it would be desirable to avoid crisis, but uh, my personal thought is that we will never be. Uh, yeah, capable of doing so. And the question is, which kind of crisis do we have, right? Do we have a crisis where unemployment drops heavily, where people lose their job, where we see a large decline in GDP growth? Or do we have a system in, in which we see like a upward growth or maybe some stable growth in the near future given climate change issue issues where we just fluctuate around this but not with heavy cycles? And I think this was kind of the idea of the introduction of macroprudential regulation, right? Knowing that we will never be able to avoid these kind of fluctuations around some trend, but we want to limit the excesses, especially knowing and what you also show in your work and what your co-authors have discussed, that if we see this crisis, this heavy crisis, we see also this increases in inequality, which we would like to avoid. Um, can I ask before we, and I, I think we owe the audience, we've looked at, these big questions, and we have to go a little bit maybe into what's the current debate very much, but I, I want to ask each three of you um, the question, 
let me phrase it this way. I mean, we've seen from Daniel's work and Matt's work um, that we pretty much had financial crises under any regulatory, monetary, political regime across time. So what is it deep down, if it's not regulation, if it's not the monetary regime, what is it that produces crises? Is it what Casper in the end works about, that we just don't know the future, we get carried away and we extrapolate from what others do? Or what, what, what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I, also, I don't have the answer. I wouldn't have an answer. So, Isabel, you want to start? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, but I think it's a combination of, a, I think, bad incentives, to the very short-term orientation in the markets. And, I mean, it's not... Uh, in the book, you had a, there was a discussion on bank CEOs and they, they had skin in the game and, nevertheless, you know, things went wrong, so it cannot be bad incentives. But I think shareholders are very short-term oriented, right? And the point is you're compared in the industry relative to other institutions in the short-term. So uh, there's a very interesting book, it's a bit older by now, by Paul Blustein on, on, the, on the Argentinian crisis, right? And he writes about people in the financial sector who saw the crisis coming and traded in that respect and lost money initially, right? Because if everybody's trading on the market going up, then you're the one losing money and these people lost their jobs, right? So there's this kind of short-termism and if in the short term you don't make more money than the other one, then of course you're out. So, you know, everybody can be wrong, that's fine. But, and if you're right and the others are wrong, it's actually you know, worse for those who are right. So I think that's, that's, that's part of the issue. And then there's bad beliefs. I mean, at least I, I was an economist covering the housing market in the US before the crisis. Um, I was at the ECB and the Bank of Canada, and we always, as the economist of the US economy said, there's gonna be a housing market crash. And people were just so fed up of us saying that, right? I mean, you know, you don't wanna spoil the party. You know, you, at some point you, you continue to say it, but if you repeat it, it never happens. People say, ah, oh, there the doomsday people come again, right? So, you know, you predict 10 out of 10 crises that never happened. And so I think these factors combined, you know, do create this kind of exuberance. Then the question is what triggers that? And, you know, maybe there's a fundamental shock initially that triggers that, and then it starts taking a life of its own that goes beyond that. But I think these factors are very important in, in, in explaining financial crisis. And I do think as a side of market regulation does matter a little bit to mitigate the impact. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, you're trying to, to find it out also in your book. Um, but I think maybe we are missing also some insights on which I'm also not an expert. We are talking about sentiments and uh, aspects like over-pessimism or uh, being over-optimistic in the beginning and then over-pessimistic. And I think this is really true and it's also what we observe in the data. But I think there are also many other factors behind that we as economists are not looking at. For example, types of hurting. So why do we hurt? Is it like a feeling of belonging or is it like, okay, there is some bubble and I have to hope to improve my personal life? Um, but also aspects like greed. So I think there are many different also kind of feelings out in this world that drive this kind of behavior. And, um, and if it is, is this really the root of, of this kind of crisis, then maybe also as a regulator that, that might, uh, might ask questions. So if you only target incentives, then this kind of um, factors being hidden in beliefs won't be targeted by regulation and we will never be able to basically um, curb crisis. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think that uh, I, in, in your introduction, you're saying that it's half bad incentives and half bad be beliefs. This is your, uh, your view, at least in the summary. And uh, uh, I, I, I share the view. I don't know if it is really half and half or it is uh, 70 and 30. I, I don't know. Uh, for sure, the issue regarding incentives is something that we know. And we know also that regulation can mitigate, but, uh, well, the historian is here and we have uh, history and history of, uh, of cases when regulation has been arbitrage away. Mm -hmm. And actually, all the time that you have a rule, there is clearly a huge incentive by all <coughs> the market participants to try to circumvent it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if you're looking to how the Venetian were, uh, uh, you know, inventing derivatives exactly to mm -hmm. circumvent some of the uh, law imposed by, uh, by the Pope of not paying interest rates, you know, so it's not new, this story. Uh, and it means that it's part of the human behavior in some sense. That's why I think uh, uh, we can try to 
play some some battle with the mm -hmm. with the regulation we can learn but clearly the the system is evolving so much that clearly there will be always uh, this type of issue and clearly on the other side is uh, bad beliefs on this side i think we need uh, i think to try to uh, do an effort that is to think on a different way uh, on uh, how people behave and believes. For example, at this on these regards, I want to cite the, the book of Andrew Lloyd that I don't know if you know, is, ad is called Adaptive Markets Hypothesis, mm -hmm. where in some sense is, is going in line with what Casper uh, uh, just showed to us, that people are forming beliefs based on their past history. So if things are going well, they're expecting this going well. And if things are going badly, they're expecting they will go badly, even if this is not the case. So this adaptive expectation, in some sense, can justify, if you want, both the burst and, let's say, the, uh, let's say the, uh, the crash that are amplified. So maybe this is also some part that can be uh, investigated uh, a little bit more deeply. But uh, in general, I think that we can mitigate these two things. Uh, we cannot pretend that uh, we are so perfect that we will be able to eliminate uh, uh, these two because they are, are part of our human, uh, let's say, behavior. So I don't think that we can try to do something, but uh, we cannot pretend to, to eliminate them completely. At least this is what I'm not expecting. Great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to open it up. Get your questions ready. I'm going to ask a question to them so you have time to prepare. But get it ready. The next round is on you. We have seen in the last six, seven months a five, six standard deviation move on inflation, five, six standard deviation move on long-term interest rates. Wouldn't it be extremely surprising if what we've seen with the British pension funds is the only pocket of maturity, uh, mismatch, and um, risky short-term borrowing in the global financial system. Where are the risks, and uh, how bad are they going forward? So you get the questions. Whoever wants to take it. Well, I can start. Okay. So, you know, well, we know that the, the world is becoming more and more leveraged, and I like also the title of, of, of the book, and clearly, uh, for several reasons. I'm, I'm buying all the different reasons, and clearly this is something that uh, when you are in this situation with high inflation, on one side is a good thing, because, you know, with a large leverage and large inflation, clearly the debt in, uh, let's say, in purchase power is going to reduce. So on one side, we need to read it in a good way. On the other side, uh, we need to ask to ourselves, where are then the problem? And the problem are if this debt that we are taking are long-term debt or short-term debt, and it is floating of fixed interest rates. So if this leverage uh, that we are facing is largely driven by debt that are very, very, with a very long maturity and are fixed interest rate, I think we are in a good shape. If this is not the case, then, uh, well, either we have uh, the central bank intervening and solving all the time this problem, or we will have some, some big problem. But uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the fact that we have a large inflation, we need also to think on, uh, on the fact that uh, uh, it can create some problem. But on the other side, all this debt, mostly the public one, means that we are hypothecating the future of the new generation. So if we are able to solve this huge leverage in some way, and historically, it seems that uh, mostly large sovereign debt has been always 70% of the cases, this is the paper by uh, Romer, uh, the book by Romer and Romer, uh, told us that it has been solved by inflation, then we need to be clearly uh, scared that maybe something can happen, but maybe it's going also to solve some of our problem. I'm a bit more concerned. <laughs> I'm a bit more concerned because the source of the inflation is a supply side shock, at least in Europe very much, right? So it's a shock that increases inflation but lowers growth. And so if you look at the R minus G dynamics, if you do believe that the central bank wants to maintain price stability, then, you know, at least for those who are highly leveraged, right, 
it may be a difficult time, right? And I mean, the, a, a big question mark is really, where do we go with long-term growth, right? You know, what is the long-term growth model? And, and I mean, those are big questions, um, you know, especially in an environment where we're talking about some shocks, which, you know, are very difficult to grasp, like the geopolitical developments. What will that do to our long-term growth outlook, right? I mean, you know, with whom are we going to be trading? You know, are we going to have the globalized world that we see today? If not, you know, what does that mean for the long-term growth outlook? I mean, we're also grappling with issues such as climate change, which require a lot of investment, right? So that will make maybe even more leverage, right, in some ways, but, you know, and, and it may has to, has to be done. But at the same time, how are you going to finance for that? So I think it's going to be a very challenging environment going forward. And, you know, the high leverage means that our managed G, you know, maybe still it, it, it looks good today, but it can flip very quickly flip around, right? So... Um, you know, the more leveraged you are, the more quickly you can have uh, concerns that it's not sustainable. So wrong, you know, wrong signals, wrong communications can quickly have very big effects. Yeah, let, let me just add one thing. But clearly yeah. the problem is that maybe we, are not we shouldn't finance, you know, climate change and all these things with debt. We need to finance them the with equity. equity. Yeah, sure. That's the, so this is yeah. the key point. We need to change the way in which we are financing it, yeah. so not continue to do it even more. No, no, this, I, I fully agree. Yeah. It's just that there's a risk that, you know, these yeah, yeah, challenges no, of course, res of course. result in even more debt financing. we need to financing. get rid of this debt in yes, some way. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very difficult question, but I think the good thing maybe is that we are aware of, of all these challenges. And usually what you see with financial crisis is that there's something unexpected happening. But we expect all of these challenges ahead. So this kind of asks whether we are preparing for it. So for example, the ESRB in its warning also issued like this uh, idea that banks should prepare for it. It's not that uh, they will be surprised by what is going to happen. But still, um, even if the banking sector is kind of tightly regulated and we have seen all of these improvements and we have learned from the crisis, I think there's also another sector where regulation is lagging and that is the non-bank financial sector. Mm -hmm. And I think here it's also like what uh, Loriana is pointing at, that here is really the risk that if there is some liquidity crisis, um, the ECB or the central banks around the world um, will or have to step in. And uh, the, the, the key thing here is that all the lessons we have learned and applied to the banking sector have not been done for this sector. And I think this is, could really be like a crucial um, part of the problem. Can I maybe just jump on one thing? Sure. I mean, we're talking a lot about liquidity crisis, right? And it's true then that there's a role for the central bank, but not for solvency crisis, right? And so if at some point you have a solvency problem, then, you know, th that doesn't lie in the lap of the central banks anymore. And I think many of the risks we're talking about are actually even solvency risks, not just liquidity yeah. risks. One thing is a bad dynamics that feeds on itself that you want to stop because it's a bad equilibrium. And it's another thing that that's the equilibrium you have because you have a, an insolvency issue, right? Uh, I'll um, happily, there's a microphone here, so maybe you'll raise your hand if, um, if there are questions. There's one, one in the back. We can also yeah, collect a few. I think Jan here in front, Carmen in the back. Yeah. Let's, let's not do more than three, I think. Let's yeah. do maybe three and then. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Philip, um, and I really like this take of Loriana that, um, yeah, financial stability instability is maybe also an endogenous problem um, and maybe this stems from let's say um, the take that we have a monetary policy response um, to financial instability so the question would be what are other options as a response like do you see already sufficient macro prudential tools is it maybe also a role for banking supervision to play i, I work in banking supervision so um, very interested on that or um, yeah maybe is there even a role for a central bank di digital currency to interact a bit more closely with uh, um, um, consumers or uh, companies and not through the financial sector thanks for yeah thank you so that was a great debate <laughs> so far so thank you very much so let me ask one question the, the whole thing is about leverage and the main response to the last crisis was to deleverage the banking sector, right? To build up equity mm -hmm. and also to invent bail inable debt, so make debt responsible, so to speak. So, what, what, how do you judge, so to speak, this development? And 
there, in my introduction, I said this is really, I take this as, an, as, a, as a signal that the current shock that we are experiencing did not lead to a banking crisis. And so that there was a more resilient system that we have been building. And so the real answer for leverage would be deleverage, right? And, and you can do this, you can design this. My question to Kaspar is, is one uh, that relates to uh, the idea that over-optimism uh, leads to crisis, or every crisis is, is basically uh, anticipated by over -optimism. But isn't this a bit a tautology? So don't you, is, so if the, you, you form expectations and the real outcome is a random variable around your expectations, Right, so sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less because you have an expected value. So if it's lower, if the real outcome is lower, of course you exposed, you look uh, like over optimistic. But isn't that almost by definition always the case? Or must it be the case? Um, actually, these were quite a lot of questions. Should we do a first round and then come and kicks off the second? Yeah. Um, who wants to go? I think the first one was for you. Please. Yes. Yeah. So and then we need to give Casper a, a, a mic. Okay. So if I understand well, you know, the question is, what can we do, or is macro prudential or the banking supervision enough to, uh, let's say, to reduce uh, uh, the incentives or, or the size of, of the financial sector? Uh, you know, well, I know that the ESRB produced this warning. I will, I'm, I'm the chair of the advisory scientific committee of the European Systemic Risk Board, so I know also all the issue behind this warning that the, the ESRB is providing. I think that, uh, uh, you know, it is also done by people, this type of macroprudential and banking supervisor. So it is having a lot of limitation. I'm, I'm, I don't want to, 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 to be too pessimistic, but uh, uh, now that I'm a little bit more involved on, and I see, you know, the type of debate that you have when you have to decide about the dividend ban, about doing a warning or not, about giving a recommendation or not, uh, yes, it can help, but it's done also by people, even this type of thing, so they have limitation, and, you know, is the central bank digital currency going to solve uh, this problem? Well, I don't know too much, and uh, I'm not able to answer to this question uh, directly, but again, my impression is that uh, we are limiting even more the role of the classical financial markets as soon as we are moving uh, under this dimension, because you know, then you will have deposit at the central bank, and, and then it is not clear what will be then the role of the banks in this framework. But and we need clearly more studies about this. I, I, I'm not so convinced that the solution in any case it will be this one, but I'm happy to know. Yeah, maybe I tie on to it because on, on, on the central bank digital currency, I think there's a, there's a risk in the financial system, which if, I mean, if you open the Financial Times or a newspaper these days, it's about crypto somewhere. I mentioned, right? And I think there are risks there, right? And what, what you can say is with a central bank digital currency, you offer money, let's say, save money in the digital world. And the question is then, do you still need cryptocurrency? And I know some will not like it when I say no, right? You can basically regulate this away because the business that is in there, and I think my colleague Ulrich Binsar has a blog today on the on the ECB website saying, you know, there's not much legitimate business going on there anymore, right? And so in that sense, I think, yes, the central bank digital currency can help in reducing risks in that sense, right? Um, and, and, and it basically allows for money not only in cash, but also to have central bank money in the digital age, which is quite important. Um, uh, I mean, the, another, another point I just wanted to, to, to tie on to is, I mean, the discussion, yes, I mean, like, don't blame the one who kind of tries to tackle when there is a crisis or a liquidity crisis, the problem which is the central bank, right? I mean, I think at that point, you know, the issues have already built up and the best response to that is then still at least to mitigate the, the, the negative effects, right? I mean, the question is more how do you avoid that you get there and also can these responses be designed in a way that you avoid these kind of, or at least mitigate these moral hazard problems, right? So I think that is, something where you know, more research, more analysis can be done. I think we've already learned a lot, but there's, there's much more we can think about. Right? And as central bank tools, 
have become more plentiful before it was interest rates, but now we have more tools. We can think much more about the design of them, right? We can do, be much more refined than we were before. Interest rates is a very blunt tool, but if you start going to, for instance, we at TCB, we had Teltros, right? You have conditions that come along with those. And you can think very much about the design to say, okay, they should be useful and achieve their aim, but we should avoid that, you know, it creates moral hazard problems and that financial institutions have the sense that whatever happens, you're going to stand there with this backstop, right? I mean, you know, the other thing is, of course, you know, central banks provide liquidity to banks as a general rule, and there's a reason for that, right? Banks are regulated, right? Non-banks are not so regulated. They don't have access directly to our balance sheet. Right. And this is also a big discussion to have, but I think it's an important thing to keep in the back of the mind that you know the, yeah. the ones that have access are, are the banks because they are regulated. Yeah, but when you have the market maker of last resort, then you don't have any more just the banks having access to the road, to this part. Well, they, they don't access our balance sheet and that's in what the central bank intervenes in the financial markets. And of course, as mentioned before, it's on liquidity issues, right? It's not to tackle solvency issues. And that's still... That's also quite important to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah let me maybe quickly come in and also re re respond to, to Jan's question. I think the, the lesson learned also from 2008 and then applied in 2020 was that, you know, if you keep these asset prices high enough, the banks don't have a problem. So you go into the bond markets, you go into where the, you know, where potentially the massive repricing would take place, you support these markets through the mechanism that Loriana talks about, and of course then banks don't have a problem. But this being said, look, more equity is always good for any given shock, more equity is always uh, obviously, you know, on the same page there. But I, I think the, 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 this, the narrative of 2020 and the COVID shock being purely like a success of increasing capital ratios and that's why the banks I think you know there's there's been a lot of intervention including in repo markets when treasury markets froze up like not I mean what would be well, how would these banks look like if we had this let this happen no? so it's 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 complex but maybe Casper you want to also come in uh, yeah uh, let me maybe quickly also say something on, on leverage mm -hmm. um, I think with leverage the key thing to understand is that it still also remains an equilibrium concept. So the thing that you're avoiding is not so much that there's another crisis, it's rather the amplification of the crisis that you might avoid. But then you also must accept that you have a crisis, no, and they don't intervene necessarily. So like throughout history, no way like 30% capital ratios historically, banking system was very risky. They did very risky things. The banking system is doing much less risky things on average today, but with much less capital. So it's just a very different system but both systems uh, have seen crises, I think. And um, yeah, on extrapolation, I think the idea is very much not that, um, that the fundamentals are much, much worse than expected. So the idea is really that, like, that stock returns on average are much, much lower after these events, for example. You can actually predict stock returns going forward. You can, in a way, make money on trading on these credit cycles if you would like to do that. Right. Uh, I think Carmen, and then in the back, if you raise your hand again, it might have gone lost. In the, yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Um, hi, I'm Carmen. I work for EABH, and um, my question is a very general one. So we have talked about crisis and what is a crisis and what causes a crisis, and you all agreed more or less that we cannot avoid crisis, right? They're part of whatever game we play. But what I always thought about the 2008-2009 crisis was that there was such a divide between those who, who made profits before in the upswing and those who in the end carried the losses systemically. And um, I was wondering if you see that has changed since then or do you think there's still a huge divide between these two factors? Yeah, my question is directed to Professor Loriano Pelizon. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you're critical of the role of the central bank for interfering sometimes too much. Um, but given that banks are and financial systems are more interconnected, do you think that uh, it's possible to actually let a bank fail and for it to be a uh, confined event and for contagion effects not to be quite dangerous in that situation? Um, maybe one more if there's, otherwise we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Lena, you wanna take the first one and then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
a very interesting question. And um, I mean, from history, we know that it's often like this, right? It's a very selected part of the population benefiting from boom times and accumulating wealth, while in the crisis, it's the poorest that are hit most. So whether we are seeing this uh, also like during these times where we still have not a crisis, crisis uh, fortunately, um, probably yes, because you might just ask who is participating in financial markets, and it's also a very selected set of the population. So it's also those who invested in, in, in shares, for example, who have benefited from, from a share price bubbles. It's those who have like enough money to, to take a mortgage and, and buy a house, who have benefited from, from the house price bubble. And it's again those um, that are at the poorest edge of the population who cannot participate in all of these um, developments. So yeah, probably yes. Okay, so regarding you know uh, the the role of the of the central banks as land of last resort or as money market of last resort, uh, it's not that I'm saying I'm, I'm making the point that clearly we know the crisis of 2008 told us that you know if you make a bank to fail and is highly interconnected, this will create a lot of problems. So clearly, this is not something that we want. The fact is that it, the intervention. Uh, that we are observing so far done by the central banks are all done in a hurry. Uh, now that in some sense they did it, I think we need to figure out a mechanism that is trying to reduce as much as possible, let's say, the moral hazard. I'm giving some example. Do it with a very large penalty and do it very quickly. So go out quickly as soon as you intervene in the market. Not, you know, do the intervention. What we observe from the past crisis is that uh, easily there is the intervention, but then the unwinding on what it has been done, it takes so much time that the market then is in some sense, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, influenced that, you know, then it is difficult to restart uh, the market in the right way. So it has to be done uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, it is really minimizing the risk that then everything will become normal. <coughs> uh, so that's my point. Not that, you, you know, you completely have to eliminate it because we know it's inconsistent. This type of idea that they shouldn't do it full stop is not working. But it has to be done in a way that, you know, it is uh, creating uh, the minimum level of moral hazard and, let's say, disruption of the functioning of the market. And you can do it. You can do it by making it, as I say, in a, in a very penalized way, and second, uh, doing it very quickly, going out quickly from the market. Isabel, last word. Yeah, I just had to think of the Bank of England, actually, and what has happened very recently with uh, with the pension funds problems that they had where they stepped in quickly but also had a time limit and stepped out, right? So and this is kind of, I think, also lessons learned and they did it for financial stability reasons and then that's why they were so very targeted. I mean, just on the, on the, on the question of um, uh, to what extent, you know, those who lose and, and those who profit has the balance changed, at least I think in European regulation, they try to change certain things, especially on the bailouts of the banks, right? So it's much more harder for having the taxpayers paying the bill for a bank bailout. You know, of course, we've had less bank failures, right? So the system has not been tested uh, sufficiently, but at least the system is set up in such a way that we would hope that you know, the taxpayer should less easily pay, pay the brunt uh, of, of uh, you know, failure. Hopefully, that there's no crisis that has to test this system. Mm. But, yeah. We shall see. Thank you very much. We have to wind it up and continue the conversation over uh, uh, drinks in the back. I want to say thank you again to three of you, to Kasper, Dani, but also to Jan, for Flo, to Frau Albrecht, the whole team at SAFE who made this possible. Um, we hope we intrigue you a little bit with the book and the discussion, and uh, we we'll look forward to continuing the conversation now with a glass of wine or whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.